Good morning and welcome to worship with Ardmore Baptist Church on this sixth Sunday of Easter. We're so excited that you've joined us this morning for worship and if this is your first time tuning in with us, we welcome you from wherever you may be watching this morning. If you would like to follow along with today's service, we invite you to visit our website at ardmorebaptist.org to find a copy of today's bulletin. May we remember as we enter into this time of worship that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us sing, let us listen, let us play, let us find meaning, let us be glad in it.
come to worship you today, bound together in love of Christ. In, in spite of our differences, differences your, your love, love continues, continues to draw us together. together. Be with us today as we rejoice in the power of your love. Teach, Teach us to see each brother and sister with your eyes. Help us learn to live in community together, loving one another, and respecting one another in everything that we do and say. Help, Help us to mirror your grace, grace and, and unconditional love, love to all, all people. people. Only through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, can we achieve this. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise calls us to be one in Christ as we worship and serve together, sharing God's love and grace to all of God's children. The hymn is hymn 271, Christian people sing together and we'll sing this to the tune of joyful, joyful, we adore thee. A reading from Galatians 2, verse 1 to 10. Then after 14 years, I went up against to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation. Then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. But because of false believers, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us, we did not submit to them, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And for those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to, to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel circumcised, 
just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised? For he who walked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also walked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John were acknowledged peers, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and, and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, friends. It's good to see you today. Children, why don't you scooch on in for our special time together? I wanted to share with you today about a story that I've really come to enjoy, and it is the story of Frozen 2, of two sisters, Anna and Elsa, and how they are searching for um, more answers to um, learn about their parents. And so, actually what happens in the story is they go on this quest and they, um, they go into this cloud and so they're in this like cloud bubble and they discover that there are these two people groups in this cloud um, and they are feuding that they don't like each other and they are constantly fighting every time they refind each other in this bubble. And so it's actually, here we go, let me see if I can show you. It's actually the people from Arendelle where Anna and Elsa are from and the people of North Uldra now, I don't want to scare everything away, but I just want you to know that, that these people are important too, okay? So these people are important, and these people are important. Here's what I'm thinking about. In the story, we learn that one group of people thinks the other group of people aren't important. They think that this group of people aren't worth enough. They think they're scared. They're living in fear that these people will have too much power. And so they fight. They actually start a fight with the people of North Ultra, and it doesn't go very well. Today in our passage from Pastor Tyler, he's going to talk to you about two groups of people that were trying to follow Jesus and who all of a sudden got scared. One group said, we need everybody, everybody, everybody to know about Jesus so that they can follow Jesus because Jesus is so good and so important that we want them all to know Jesus. The other group of people, well, they got, I think they might've gotten a little confused or a little lost. They were too worried about what people would think. What will people think of me if I say that everybody deserves the good news of Jesus? And so they, they stopped telling the good news to all people. It makes me think of these folks because they were fighting because one group was scared. They were scared that these other folks would have too much power. So if you'll go with me for just a second, we're going to say this is the group of um, folks that believe that they had to be Jewish in order to follow Jesus. And these are the group of Gentiles that say you don't have to um, become a Jew first to be able to f be a follower of Jesus. And what they learned in the movie, I know, it's just a movie, but what they learned in the movie was that everybody, everybody, had a right to what was good and what was true. And what do we know as followers of Jesus that is good and true? We know that Jesus is good and true. And so everybody, everybody needs to learn about Jesus. Everybody gets the gift of grace. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Everybody gets the gift of grace that Jesus has to offer us. So the next time you watch Frozen 2, think about these two people groups and how everybody, everybody has value. Why? Well, because God made them, because they are special, because they are God's children. 
Now today we're going to pray together, and I know that we normally have um, a short and sweet prayer, but we're going to actually have our pastoral prayer together. And I'm going to pray about three things. I'm going to pray about um, the God who is our creator. We're going to pray about God of justice, and we're going to pray um, to the God who is the God of healing. And so we're going to pray to God in all of these different aspects of who God is. So let's join our hearts together as we pray. Creator God, you made us in your image. You put us in charge of caring for creation. Thank you for that responsibility. As a part of caring for creation, we are to care for one another too. We confess that we are selfish and we would rather care for our own. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for, getting, for forgetting that we are all your image bearers. God of justice, you determined right from wrong and you have shown us your ways. You see each person with love and with care because you created them. We confess that we see injustice around us and sometimes we ignore it. Other times we help in continuing injustice and still other times we are paralyzed by injustice. Forgive us when we hold on to power and self-preservation so tightly that we ignore the needs of others. Give us determination and courage to passionately and caringly right the wrongs that we see on behalf of another. Let the truth of the gospel remain in us as we work. Healer God, you are ever present, working through all things to bring about healing. Thank you for the ways that you heal people's hearts and soothe souls. We confess that there are times when we don't want to be healed and when we can't seem to want healing for another person because of our own wounds. Forgive us when we try to get in the way of the ways that you are working to reconcile us and others. Thank you for working, working to soften us so that we might be healed and see the need for healing that others have. Help us to be present with others as you work in them and help us to be agents of healing and change. God, who is our creator, God, who is the God of justice, and God, who is our healer, we thank you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love is not perfect. 
A reading from Galatians. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou that the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I like to listen to a lot of podcasts, and one of my favorite podcasts is called Revisionist History. It's hosted by the writer Malcolm Gladwell, and my favorite episode of this podcast deals with the greatest basketball game in NBA history. You see, in all of the NBA, there was only one game where a player has scored more than 100 points in a single game. It took place in 1962. It was the Philadelphia Warriors against the New York Knicks, and the star of the Philadelphia Warriors was a player named Wilt Chamberlain. Now, you've no doubt probably heard of Wilt Chamberlain before. He was seven foot one and 275 pounds, but as tall as he was, he wasn't ungainly and awkward. Chamberlain was graceful on the basketball court. In fact, he was such a good player that the only real defense that the New York Knicks had against him was they tried to foul him as often as possible. Because as good of a player as Chamberlain was, he was known to be a notorious free throw shooter. So they would foul him in the hopes that he would miss over and over and over. But at this game in Hershey, Pennsylvania in 1962, Chamberlain did something nobody expected. Instead of shooting his free throws the normal overhanded way that's done still in the NBA today, he shot all of his free throws underhanded, and he made almost all of them. And yet, after this game in 1962, Chamberlain went back to shooting overhanded, and he also went back to being one of the most abysmal free throw shooters in the NBA. Why? Sports physicists tell us that underhanded free throw shooting is way more accurate than overhanded. And yet, underhanded free throw shooting is still denigrated in the NBA. In fact, we all know the nickname for underhanded free throw shooting, the granny shot. No offense to any grannies out there. But no NBA player wants to shoot this way. Why? Well, in his autobiography, Will Chamberlain describes what led to his decision to stop throwing free throws underhanded and to go back to doing overhanded. He writes this, I felt silly, like a sissy, shooting underhanded. I know I was wrong. I know some of the best foul shooters in history shot that way, but I just couldn't do it. Wilt Chamberlain knew that shooting underhanded was way more accurate, and yet he didn't do it because he was worried he would look silly. And to this day, with the a handful of exceptions, almost all players in the NBA continue to shoot their free throws overhanded. Why? Well, sociologists have a term for how we make decisions called our threshold model of collective behavior. It means that often the decisions that you and I make are govern governed by how that decision will make us look and be perceived by other people. Chamberlain knew the right way to shoot free throws, but he just couldn't do it because it made him look silly. What is our threshold model of collective behavior? What are the things that we might avoid doing because we're afraid of how they will make us look to other people? Well, our passage from Galatians for today deals with exactly that question. You may remember that we're in the midst of a sermon series called Finding Freedom, in which we're journeying through Paul's letter to the Galatians. What Paul is angry and mad when he writes this letter because he believes that the very stake of the, the, the very heart of the gospel is what is at stake here. 
The churches in Galatia have started listening to rival teachers of Paul's who tell them that in order to truly belong to God's people, they can't just believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They have to take on all of the rules and the regulations that come with the Torah. Even though they aren't Jewish, they are Gentile. And in our passage for today, Paul wants to look back at some of the internal conversations that the early church has had on this issue. And he does this by looking back on two scenes that we've heard read. One is in Jerusalem and one is in Antioch. Our first scene is verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2 and it takes place in Jerusalem. As we've discussed before, the early church was facing a debate about membership. And this was primarily a Jewish movement in these days that also started to reach out to some Gentiles. And this caused some questions to rise up. If this is still primarily a Jewish movement, what does it look like when somebody who is not Jewish wants to follow Jesus as the Messiah? In the book of Acts, in chapter 15, we read that this was causing some division within the early church leadership. And so it was decided that Paul, who was preaching to the Gentiles, would travel to Jerusalem to discuss this matter with the early church. And here in Galatians 2, 1 to 10, we get Paul's perspective of this council meeting that took place. When Paul goes to meet with the early apostles, he shrewdly takes with him his friends Barnabas and Titus. Now there's some brilliant strategy at work here. Barnabas was a Jew. Titus was a Gentile. Paul is probably bringing the both of them to show the early church leaders how the gospel can take root in both Jewish people and in Gentile people. Paul goes to the leaders of the Jerusalem church to tell them about what it sounds like when he presents the gospel to Gentiles. And Paul also points out that the Jerusalem leaders had no problem with his friend Titus remaining uncircumcised. Paul's probably wanting these early Christians in Galatia to know that the rival teachers who are now requiring that they become circumcised are not even in alignment with the pillars of the early church in Jerusalem. Paul says that there are some spies who come into the meeting and try to mess up the message, but even with that hiccup, Paul says that the Jerusalem church leaders blessed his ministry to the Gentiles. Paul says this in verse 9 of chapter 2, They gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. In the ancient world, the handshake was considered the ratification of a mutual agreement. See, this scene in Jerusalem is a good reminder of what it can look like when Christians disagree with one another well. And I don't want to alarm anybody out there, but Christians do not always agree on everything. I know. I'm shocked too. See, some, some of us think that our way of reading the Bible, our way of musically worshiping, our way of leading a church, our way of living out our faith is the right way and the only way. And some people see it as their job to police or dictate the faith of others because they feel like that they are in the right. They think that they are immune from any criticism because they have all of the right answers. The truth is, is there's really only one word for that kind of attitude. And that is arrogance. See, Paul here is challenging the Jerusalem leaders to open up their minds to a new way of understanding the gospel. And to their credit, these leaders in Jerusalem bless this new way even if they don't fully agree with it. I wonder, Ardmore Baptist Church, what are new ways of expressing the gospel that we may need to be open to? 
And does the gospel that we tell the world, does it truly seek to create one human family? Or does it put up barriers between people and God? See, because the, the heart of Paul's preaching is that the progress of the gospel is the mission of God in the world, what theologians call the Missio Dei. And our job is not to try to reinvent the mission of God. It's not to try to cast God in our own image. Our job is to look for the movement of the Spirit in the world and then run to catch up. So what are new ways that God is at work in our community that we need to partner with? There is just one thing that the Jerusalem leaders ask of Paul and Barnabas in verse 10, he says, they only ask one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. See, what should unite all Christians, regardless of denomination or interpretation, ecclesial structure, or anything else that might divide us, what should unite us is a deep and abiding concern for the poor and the marginalized in our community. For the previous two weekends, our church was uh, holding an event that we called Pack the Bus, where one of our church buses was out there in the parking lot and, and people would drive by and they would bring food and hygiene products that went to City Lights Ministry and Samaritan's Ministry. Uh, these are two amazing, wonderful ministries that are helping care for the poor and the marginalized here in Winston-Salem. And I was blessed to work one of the shifts where we were collecting items from people. I saw all kinds of wonderful members of Ardmore, but I also saw other people. Other people from other churches in our community who came and we added their stuff to our stuff. The body of Christ serving and loving the poor together. It is one of the things that should unite us as followers of Jesus. So in this first scene in Jerusalem, Paul has walked away feeling like his mission has been affirmed and blessed by these uh, early church leaders in Jerusalem. The second scene is in verses 11 to 14 in our passage, and it takes place in the ancient Greek city of Antioch. And this time, the parties involved are Paul and the apostle Peter. Peter was a highly respected leader in the early church, and when Peter first came to Antioch, he found a very mixed community of Gentiles and Jews, and Peter found that they were in community together, even to the point where they were sharing table together and eating with one another. See, in the ancient world, sharing table with somebody meant something significant. It wasn't simply a matter of being in the same room or sharing the same food together. Sharing table with somebody sent the message that you were affirming this person and that you were pledging your life to them. That is why Jews tended to eat separate from Gentiles. For Jews, it was a way to protect their way of life. There are even ancient rabbinic texts in which Jews were to set out separate bottles of wine, separate plates, separate dishes of food, if they ever did have a dinner with mixed company. But here in Antioch, Peter shared his table with both Jews and Gentiles. And in the book of Acts, we know that Peter was on a bit of a progressive journey on this issue. In Acts chapter 10, we read about how Peter had this vision of seeing a sheep come down from heaven that had all kinds of different animals on it, including those that were not kosher to eat. And a voice, God's voice, spoke to Peter and said, Peter, take and eat. Peter protested and said, Lord, I'm not going to eat these animals. Uh, uh, they are unclean. I can't eat anything uh, unclean. And God's voice says to Peter in his dream, Do not call anything I have made unclean. And Peter wakes up, and right at that minute, there's a knock on his door, 
And it is the Gentile Cornelius who is inviting Peter to have dinner with his family. Peter goes and has dinner with them. He shares the gospel with them. And he baptizes his whole family that day. See, Peter had begun to embrace a larger vision of the gospel that was similar to what Paul had been preaching. But then something happened. A threshold model of collective behavior. We read in verse 12 of chapter 2, Until certain people came from James, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. Peter has reached his threshold. He seems to have adapted his earlier behavior. He's willing to share table and eat with Gentile Christians. He's shooting underhanded free throws. But then along come some people and suddenly he begins to worry about what they are going to think of him. So when James and some of the other leaders come around, Peter reverts to shooting overhanded free throws. He stops sharing the table with Gentiles. Peter adopts the separate but equal policy of the Jerusalem leaders. But to Paul, this policy is heartbreaking. For Paul, even if Peter and James and the others mean well with their actions, they are still othering the Gentile Christians. They are still creating divisions and creating an us versus them atmosphere in the early church. And Paul believes that Peter is, to put it bluntly, being a coward. In the Greek, he accuses Peter of being driven by fear. And for Paul, fear is never a legitimate motivation And it has angered Paul to his core. That is why our passage for today ends with Paul publicly confronting Peter and saying to him, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul is saying to Peter, you shared table with your Gentile sisters and brothers, and now you've decided to go back to excluding them? How do you think that's going to make them feel? And how can you possibly expect to teach them anything about good news by keeping them at arm's length? See, Peter's threshold model of collective behavior said that he was fine to eat with the Gentiles so long as it didn't cost him anything. And once he worried about looking silly or looking weak or looking like he was playing fast and loose with Scripture, he changed his behavior. And what angered Paul more than anything else is that while Peter was hiding behind this public image of purity, he was excluding the Gentiles from feeling like they truly belonged to the people of God. And Paul believes deep in his bones that this is an issue at the very heart of the gospel. Now see, there's always been a temptation in Christianity to marry together the gospel and our way of life. We sometimes can inadvertently send the message that in order to fully belong to the people of God, you have to adopt not only our faith, but our cultural way of living. And when we do that, and when people do not make all the decisions that we think we should, we tend to other them. We tend to create categories of us versus them. And Paul believes that grace cuts through all the labels and the categories that we place on ourselves and on one another. Paul believes that this gospel is truly for everyone, Jew and Gentile, black and white, men and women, conservative and liberal. Paul believes that nothing, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, we have no right whatsoever to put up our own barriers between other people and God. See, for Paul, 
We can have a lot of disagreement with one another in the body of Christ. We can disagree on a a wide variety of issues and interpretations, and, and that's fine. But when we start excluding, when we start holding other believers at arm's length, when we start wanting other people to become like us in order to truly belong to the people of God, then we've crossed a line. And Paul wants his friend Peter to know that he has no right to treat anybody as a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. After all, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Paul was angry because some of God's people were initially very open to the Gentiles and then changed their habits. They stopped being so welcoming because they did not want to look weak. They stopped throwing underhanded because they did not want to look silly. Now I wonder, are there people in my life that I perhaps would speak up for more? People who I might advocate for? People who I might defend? But I don't want to look silly. Or maybe I don't want to look weak. If it meant embracing other people, Paul was willing to look silly. Paul was willing to get angry. Paul was willing to reject the either-or categories of us versus them that had been put up by others. Paul was willing to embrace the marginalized and the discriminated against. Paul's threshold model of collective behavior was not what other people thought about him. His standard was the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and nothing else. Well, Ardmore Baptist Church, are we willing to look silly? Are we willing to get angry when we see other people being excluded? Are we willing to set aside what other people might think about us? And are we willing to cross over the boundaries of us versus them and stand with those who need to know that they belong? What if we look silly? What if we cared too much about what people think of us? What if some people think maybe we don't take the Bible seriously enough? Well, what Paul says here is that if you are not willing to embrace the marginalized in your community, you are not taking the Bible seriously enough. What Paul says here is that we are to extend grace and welcome to all people. Because through Christ, God has extended grace and welcome to you and to me. The band Gunger has a beautiful song called Us For Them. And here's a few of the lyrics of that song. When the lines are drawn, when you're in or out, when it when it's us or them, and we shame the doubt. It is all a lie. All we ever really need is love. There's no need to shed more blood. Look upon the cross. So we will not fight their wars. We will not fall in line. Because if it's us or them, it's us for them. It's us for them. We reject the either or. They can't define us anymore, because if it's us or them, it's us for them. Thanks be to God. So, what guides our behavior? Is it what other people think of us, or is it our allegiance to the gospel of King Jesus. For Paul, what he wanted Peter and the other early church leaders to realize is that if the gospel is not for everybody, the gospel is for nobody. And if you are treating people as second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, you don't really have any good news. You know, we, like all Baptist churches across the world every Sunday, have a moment at the end of our service that we call the time of response, or some churches call it the invitation. And 
It's an opportunity for people to walk forward. We sometimes call that an altar call. People can walk forward to accept Christ for the first time or to rededicate their lives to Christ or maybe to join the church. And if that's where you are, uh, I invite you to respond in that way. Reach out to us at Ardmore and we would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. But the truth is, is that the altar call is fairly recent in Christian history. It wasn't truly practiced until the early 1800s during the revival movements here in the United States. And one of the main preachers that used altar calls was Charles Finney. In the 1830s, Finney would go and, and preach to congregations and crowds. And at the very end of the service, after he would talked about God's grace and love for all people, he would take a piece of paper and plop it at the front of the room, and he would say, if you take your faith in Jesus seriously, you will come forward and put your name down on this piece of paper and join us in the abolitionist movement. Because Finney believed that if we are going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, then we have to put our money where our mouth is in how other people are treated. We are in the midst of a partisan and divided time in our country. The rhetoric is mean-spirited and often divisive. Are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? Maybe what is needed when we encounter passages like this in Galatians is for the people of God to take an assessment of how are we contributing or how are we detracting from God's human family in the way that we treat one another. Let us respond by singing this beautiful hymn of together about how no matter what we may decide divides us, what unites us is the grace of God that is shown to each and every one of us. meaning in today's worship service and before we go we have a few announcements in the life of our church that we want to let you know about first we hope that you've been able to join us for our midweek prayer and musical meditation services but if you haven't we invite you to do so these are on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. on the Ardmore Baptist Facebook page and we always try to pray for the needs in our community and then we have several minutes of beautiful musical uh, meditations and this week we get to hear from Sandy and Gustavo doing cello duets and that will be Wednesday at 12. 
This week's Word to the Wise on Thursday at 7 p.m. will be an interview between Tyler Tankersley and Walker Armstrong, who is the Executive Director of the Pilot Mountain Baptist Association. We will be hearing about how local area churches have been responding to the different needs and circumstances of COVID-19. And again, that will be on our Facebook page at 7 p.m. this Thursday. We also have something new and exciting that is happening, and it is an Ardmore Baptist Church book club. Um, if this is something that would interest you, we invite you to get in touch with Gina Brock, our associate pastor. Um, the book to be discussed first is going to be The Good Neighbor, which is a biography of our good neighbor, Fred Rogers, um, by Maxwell King. And the date for the first book club meeting on Zoom will be Monday, June 1st at 6 p.m. Um, so again, if you would like to join us for that, please get in touch with Gina Brock. Now before we go, we have a very special announcement from our pastor, Tyler Tankersley. Well, Ardmore Baptist Church, even during this pandemic, we are continuing to be the body of Christ with one another. We're continuing to be community to one another, to meet together over Zoom, uh, and to worship together online. And we've even been uh, continuing to have people join our church as members. And so today, I want to introduce you to Carrie Lanier. And uh, Carrie, and we've got a bit of an unstable internet connection, but Carrie is here with me today. He first visited Ardmore about a year ago. And he and I have had some good conversations about the journey that has led him to Ardmore Baptist Church. He told me that it's been a long journey to find a church home. But during this time of pandemic, he's heard God speak to him. And God has said that it is time for him to become a member of Ardmore Baptist Church. And Carrie, why don't you share just a little bit about what was it that uh, kind of drew you to become a member of Ardmore? First of all, I think Ardmore is um, one of the most beautiful churches that I, I think I've ever seen. It's extremely um, conducive to worship, uh, to, to just focus on God, and uh, it's been wonderful to be a part of that worship. Uh, also, I'm getting to know some very wonderful people at Ardmore. I'm finding a place where I believe that I fit in, where there's diversity, and I celebrate our diversity that we have within the church. Uh, that's a wonderful thing to me that we can all be part of the body of Christ and that our individual uh, characteristics are expressed and uh, accepted. And there's the community of love at Ardmore, I believe. Mm, that's beautifully said, Carrie. Thank you so much. And congregation, if you would celebrate this with me, why don't we say, Carrie, we welcome you. So Carrie, we welcome you. Thank you very much. One time when I was a kid, my cousin Shannon and I were playing a game of horse at my great-grandmother's house, and we both had uh, the one letter left, and so it was right down to the line, and Shannon shot a free throw that just swished through the net, and I was so worried I couldn't make the shot. My grandma, Grace, said that she would make the shot for me. She stepped up. And she did an underhanded free throw, a granny shot, and she made it and won the game for me. There's power in the granny shot. So today, if you go out and shoot free throws, try to shoot underhanded. And as you go from this place, friends, on this sixth Sunday of Easter, may the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take delight in your living and may the one who sends you send you now in joy. For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you is the one who keeps you still. Amen. Amen.